Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode three of the Open Source Podcast. Today is Wednesday, July 19th. My name is Jeremy Hess, Community Manager at Cloudify. Today, we're bringing you an informal and interesting discussion from three Tosca experts. Uh, first, we have Michael Brenner. Uh, he works at Cloudify, and he's also on the Tosca TC. We have Luke Fouquier with us uh, from Atos, Alien for Cloud. He's also part of the Tosca TC. And we have with us Tal Liron, also from Cloudify. He also works on the ARIA project, which is very closely tied in with Tosca. So it's great to have all you guys. Uh, Michael, why don't you go, go ahead and give you a quick introduction to what you do. Yes, I'm Michael Brenner. Thanks for inviting me. I'm the chief architect for NAV in uh, Cloudify. Um, I'm involved in particular in NAV standardization, both in Etsy NAV and other forum. And in the Tosca community, I also focus mostly on how to apply and use Tosca Simply YAML within the NAV domain. Uh, in that sense, we are working as an ad hoc group called NAV slash SDN ad hoc group in Tosca and trying there to define uh, what we call an NAV profile of the simple YAML 1.x, whatever 1.x may mean at that time when we finish the profile. So my, my expertise in Tosca is mainly to take the Tosca concept and apply it in the NAV space. Uh, we would like to do that in such a way that we do not necessarily create a specific Etsy NAV uh, modeling sandbox, but rather a more generic NAV sandbox where we try to take simple YAML and derive uh, from that simple YAML rather than creating a completely different dialect. Uh, I would say so far we have uh, been successful in some regards doing that in NAV profile and not so successful in other regards uh, because of the conflict at times between two principles at play. One principle that I believe very strongly about is that we need to follow the simply YAML Tosca philosophy and uh, just inherit from the Tosca normative types. The other principle at stake is, however, um, the desire to meet the demands of the Etsy NAV standardization community, which uh, passed along to us uh, stage two requirements describing the VNF information model and network service information models. And um, uh, for better or for worse, what they what Etsy NAV has done is create a very uh, hierarchical structure in that model. And if we were to fully support exactly the same structure in, you know, using uh, simple YAML, it would be very difficult without actually creating a completely different dialect in simple YAML. So these are some of the struggles we are going uh, through right now. Uh, we have reached out to other Simply YAML um, principles to help. Uh, it looks like in the short term, we will, uh, we will have a highly qualified, let's say with uh, warnings, uh, NAV profile. Uh, and we hope that in a future version, we'll be able to improve both the simple YAML uh, profile with some additional types, maybe abstract types from which to derive, but also to do better in the NAV profile uh, itself. So if, if, I, if I take a moment to answer why the first question that you posted, uh, which is why is Tosca different and better than other DSL, um, I'm sure that there are other members on this podcast that are more experts in Simply YAML than myself. So I'm going to let them as a that part. But from my perspective, what is different in, uh, in Simply YAML from other DSL is that uh, it's not just a language. It's a language. It's, to me, it's more like a framework 
for uh, deploying and orchestrating cloud application. And what I like about it is that um, it is sort of right-sized from my perspective. It's uh, standards, when standards do, don't do enough, it's not much of a standard because interoperability cannot be ensured and portability. On the other hand, if you do too much, if you over-specify things, then you very narrowly end up uh, defining a nailed down implementation, which is also not good. So my, my uh, likeness to Tosca comes actually from the uh, very fine balance that so far they've succeeded to achieve. So I, I'd like to, to see what, what uh, Luke, uh, which will introduce himself next, will, will say about that and, and then Tal. Hi, so thanks, Michael. Uh, so I'm Luc Boutier. I'm actually working at Atos and leading the Alien for Cloud project, which is uh, an implementation of Tosca uh, with uh, tooling to help you work with the, uh, with the specification, uh, help you find elements written in Tosca to share them across the enterprise and uh, bring portability to your deployments to various solutions. So, to understand, I mean, to, to explain a bit, I'm uh, also part of the uh, Tosca TC and I'm also co-editor uh, since version 1.1, .1, I think, of the uh, YAML specification. Um, so I've been working a lot in this part of, uh, on the workflow part in order to um, better define some uh, pieces that were not really written down uh, in the specification and that could uh, have led to lacks of portability. So portability is, is kind of something that I really uh, like to try to focus on because I think it's a, it's a key thing in order to have a successful uh, Tosca uh, standard actually. So uh, in regard to that, what I uh, really think uh, uh, Tosca is very good and, and maybe better than some other DSL is that I think it really focus on uh, two different things that are key in, uh, in deployment and, uh, and deployment maintain uh, kind of, of topics, which is first, it's a declarative language and declarative is very good for various things like uh, allowing collaboration between different people. And that's a very good thing and very strong thing about Tosca is that you can declare a lot of things so that people can reuse your work very easily and themselves can just make kind of declarative usage of what you provide to them and just give that to the orchestrator. And based on that declarative and intent model, the Tosca orchestrator will have enough information to know how to deploy things, how to maintain things and make things run. So there is, uh, I would say an entry cost to Tosca maybe because there is a few concepts to that because you have to define a few things, but one, you define the things and what you have uh, paid this entry cost, I would say, you have a very powerful stuff that really helps you to work with other people and to share things across the enterprise. And that's exactly how we are uh, currently used with some customer. And they really find that it's a very good way so that some teams can make some work, share it very efficiently with others. Others can consume this work and then uh, just really easily uh, deploy to potentially any kind of orchestrator. Um, the second thing is portability. And portability is not just in regard to the standard, not just about the fact that it's a standard, so there is different tool, and the work that you do with Tosca can be uh, reused with different implementers. It's also portability um, regarding the work that you've done, which you will be able to run and to, to match uh, before runtime on where you want to actually deploy things. So Tosca is, is a DSL to deploy things, and so, for example, if you want to deploy um, a VM or a machine, I would say, which could be VM, container, or, or whatever, you can have a, just a very simple abstraction of that that you're going to place in your topology, eventually place some of the components that interact with it, and then just say to your orchestrator, uh, find me the best match to deploy that. And in Tosca, you have all the different um, kind of semantics to help the orchestrator find what could be the best match for you and try to find it. So, so that's why I think it's very powerful because it really brings the ability to have both portability and this declarative model, which allow a very great collaboration around Tosca and a great way to share things in, in, an, in an enterprise context. Great stuff, Luke. Tal, um, anything to add here? 
Introduce well, yourself also. <laughs> sure. Well, I'll introduce myself and I, I have a lot to add for everything, so I'll try to be brief. But um, my name is Tal Laran. I uh, uh, work for Cloudify, but I also, you can say, work for the Apache Software Foundation because our ARIA project, uh, um, which is ARIA is an implementation of Tosca, uh, uh, is basically completely governed by the Apache Software Foundation as an incubator project uh, right now. Uh, we had our first release just two weeks ago, and uh, it's very exciting to see the ball rolling. Um, so I've been very deep in the trenches of, of Tosca for, for a long time, working a lot with the, uh, the parser and the validator and the instantiator and the orchestrator. ARIA has uh, lots of different parts to make sure that you can move from uh, a Tosca YAML template to an actually orchestrated service. Um, so I'll, in response to some of the things said here, I'll, I'll say my background is in, uh, in DevOps. And, uh, and I want to put Tosca in perspective from that maybe more technical uh, uh, background. Um, and there, you know, Tosca isn't, when you look at Tosca, it's not that innovative. Uh, we've had YAML-based languages and XML-based languages for orchestration and deployment for a long time. Uh, some of them have been more procedural. Some of them have been more declarative. We've also had a lot of object-oriented approaches to, uh, to uh, the problem of orchestration. So um, when Tosca comes along, if you just look at it as another one of these languages, it's not altogether that interesting. It has some interesting aspects in terms of how it conceives of object orientation and polymorphism. Um, but when you compare it to other solutions, um, it's, it's just another solution, technically. Um, what's really interesting about Tosca is that it is, in a way, a standard. So we've had uh, a lot of these solutions become de facto standards in, in a sense. You know, we've had Chef has been widely deployed and, and Puppet. And you can't go wrong, for example, by using Chef or even Ansible to, to create a script or a playbook or some sort of uh, a meta file that would deploy and manage your project. Um, that's already been done. It's being done as we speak. And it's very, very popular. So, so why move to Tosca? I think the difference between a de facto standard and a real standard is enormous. Uh, give me a second, just close the window here. I'm getting a lot of noise. When, when you move to a real standard and not just a widely embraced technology, uh, suddenly you get a lot of industries who wouldn't have been so interested before raising their eyebrows and, and taking a look. So, you know, we can, we, we can get into the details soon over the technical advantages and disadvantages of Tosca, but, but the advantage of being a truly embraced standard is, that for me is, is the big tipping point in terms of uh, uh, the comparison. It's, it ends up being comparing apples and oranges. You know, if you want to compare Tosca to say Chef or Juju or, or Ansible, you have to ask yourself then, well, who's, who's the, uh, the actually embraced standard by the industry here? And there's only one answer in this case. So that, that's my uh, controversial starting point. Well, I think uh, I would not, un I agree fully with you. I think that there is more interest in Tosca. And I think that one of them is exactly when you mention all these technologies like Ansible, Chef, and Puppet. Uh, today, when some people are doing some kind of Ansible scripts and Ansible playbook or Chef or Puppet, if I want to reuse them uh, because I'm in the same company, then I will have to dig into them or at least understand the language that they are run to. And I'm going to, I mean, I probably will have to write some Ansible too if I want to reuse some Ansible stuff. And same thing if I want to uh, reuse some Puppet script. And I think that the power of Tosca somehow is that if you have some existing stuff, you can very easily wrap them uh, into Tosca modeling and let the orchestrator do uh, all the job for you to call the right tools in the right way to deploy actually your thing. So you're going to be able to somehow consume as a user uh, very easily 
the element that some other people have made in whatever technology they made it and just wrap them into a kind of declarative language that is Tosca. And then the orchestrator will be able to follow up from that. And from a user perspective, that's also very interesting. Um, so still you have to do a bit of Tosca uh, YAML somehow and, and, and here your point on the standard bring make a lot of sense. Uh, but I think that also you have a, a lot of toolings to help you do that, which uh, brings even more simplicity to, to the world. Um, yeah, the, there's a good point to that. Uh, but I will point out that other, uh, the other DevOps languages have also, uh, you know, many of them are also object oriented and introduce reusability. Um, and, and Tosca also, maybe one difference is that it's, it's slightly higher level of abstraction. So, uh, for example, in ARIA, we have plugins uh, to use, um, you know, different technologies. It, it wouldn't be it actually would make complete sense to have, for example, an Ansible plugin for ARIA. So you could actually model your topology using Tosca, but underneath actually use Ansible, for example, to, um, to, to do the actual uh, uh, work underneath to, for the orchestration. So, so you, can, you can really see Tosca as one level above uh, the rest. It doesn't have to be used that way. It can be used in a more, uh, uh, in a lower level, but I think there, there, some of the, some of the places where we're seeing Tosca used really treat sometimes uh, Tosca as an orchestrator of orchestrators. So when you have a very large system, uh, very complicated, you mostly see these in the NFV world. You have uh, various aspects of orchestration and entire systems doing that. You can't really think of something like Ansible doing all your work or just Chef doing all your work. Um, you already have deployed very large systems um, that you need to interact with. So using Tosca or, or a product like ARIA can be a high level orchestration for the other orchestrators that you have. Um, that's one use that, that is very interesting. Yeah, I, I fully agree with, uh, with the notion that I think what uh, distinguishes maybe um, simply YAML from from the other examples is the the higher level uh, abstraction, right? And that kind of gets back to the point that Luke was making. Like right? in in a higher level abstraction, it is easier to describe intent in a declarative mode without getting uh, too too close to how you're going to implement that or what exact actions are going to happen, and leave that to the orchestrator. Uh, if I if I may switch a little bit here, the, the gears, I've been saying for about four or five months in different blogs that this is the, the year of Tosca. And you know, what I meant by that is actually, this is, this is the year where I think Tosca starts getting more momentum in, in real implementation. But at the other, on the other hand, it's also the year that will uh, prove if, if Tosca can, can meet the challenges or not. And in that sense, I'd like to, um, to turn uh, to, lo to look and maybe ask him uh, a very specific question because he has been involved you know, in 1.1 in, in and maybe now in 1.2. What I'd like to understand is, uh, look, what, are, what do you think are the major additional features that 1.2 will bring and what do you think are the major additional features beyond 1.2. Uh, what, I, what I have been encouraged actually to see is that um, between 1.0 and 1.2, things have accelerated and, uh, and the Simply ML team is able to crank out uh, faster versions. Uh, and that is, that is very useful. However, I have the, also the feeling that we need to find a way to engage more resources uh, in order to to really deal with um, all the, the different new features, but also to deal with with uh, with the conflicts that I expressed earlier for for the NAV domain, for example. Uh, how do you see that? So I have two questions to you. Look, one is um, what what are new features that we would expect in 1.2 and, and maybe then later in 1.3, if you have a perspective on that? And two, uh, do you think that uh, given the momentum that Tosca has and to make it the, the Tosca year, 
what would you like to see happening in terms of resources involved in the work? Well, so to the first question, I think that uh, one done two is bringing different things. It bringing first of all, I think some better specification and um, an example understanding for all the substitution mappings that Tosca provide. So substitution mapping is the capability to take a full uh, topology, so a full deployment somehow, and to rewrap it as a reusable component so that other um, other topologies can reuse this component, just, just seeing it as one single block somehow rather than, than a very complex thing. So, so it's a very cool feature to make very complex things uh, seem easy for some consumers or to just before deployment at matching replace some kind of abstraction node uh, by a very complex thing that is a complex system with whatever it means scaling as well. So all this part has been uh, really improved. So, so it brings more possibilities and more understanding. The second thing that uh, is coming in 1.2, and I hope it will make it, uh, and it won't be delayed to 1.3, is all the uh, extensions to artifact support in a way that we, will, we, we now support in Tosca um, the ability for people to define some artifacts to actually implement the node. So I think that there is two ways currently to implement a node in Tosca. One of them is to let the user specify his own artifact. And the other one is that the orchestrator, most of them provide their own implementation for some of the nodes. Um, like for example, for a compute node, I would say that most orchestrators um, like any for clouds, through cloudify or not, support the ability uh, to, for example, replace a compute node through uh, an Amazon implementation of a, of, of a VM uh, or an Azure implementation of a VM or whatever kind of implementation. So it's like out of the box kind of implementation. On the other hand, we let users really extend that uh, to implement whatever kind of nodes they want. And they can do that right now through two official artifacts, which are uh, shell scripts or Python scripts. And in addition to that, most of the users, I mean, most of the implementers support also some kind of extended artifact uh, with their own kind of internal way to execute them. And this may create some portability issues because we may not understand the same way to execute an artifact, to give parameters to it, to retrieve uh, outputs from it. And that's kind of the uh, issue that we want to address also here in 1.2 and give the ability for people to say that uh, they have an artifact type and in order to execute this artifact type, they provide an executor which somehow could derive from an existing artifact. Like I, I, as I have uh, two valid artifacts which are Python and shell and which are already specified, then you can use or define your own Ansible executor that derives from the Python executors. So the orchestrator could leverage your own logic to actually execute your Ansible, which answers two different needs, a portability need, but also the ability for some people to do very specific things. Uh, for example, we have a customer that, uh, that is a big uh, bank in France, uh, which is actually Societe Générale, which uh, usually in Cloud, And they have some very specific uh, way to download some artifacts prior to running things uh, because they have their own security constraint and so on. And so they want to be able to uh, have their own way somehow to execute some, uh, some Tosca scripts. I mean, to, to just wrap it into a kind of custom logic to check some security things uh, that are very specific to their need. And so the ability to extend artifact and provide your own artifact type um, would bring a very portable way for people to do that, uh, to, allow, to allow for some customers or some clients to uh, ship very specific use case in a portable way to any kind of Tosca implementation. So that's uh, another very big part. And I think, well, the other thing is not really tied to 1.2, but uh, I think that there is a lot of effort currently done uh, to also try to address uh, specific needs from NFV that may come uh, or for other people. There have been a, a lot of small, small additions to the specification. I don't have everything in mind right now, uh, but small things uh, there and, and so on coming from the NFV use case. And well, the last thing is that we are work, working hard to try to find uh, how we can help NAV to, uh, to actually uh, not split too much and try to lower the split in, in the future and, uh, and try to reuse our, our types, eventually change our type if, if we need to. Um, and I think that's, that's a very important thing. For the future and next version, I think that the other 
critical stuff will be to be able uh, to improve our current policy model, uh, which is very high level right now, um, in order to, to provide some probably abstract and intent policies to solve a very common use case that we see in uh, any solution like affinity and T affinity, uh, how you can define that, how it works with various uh, solution and what with what you can see in uh, in other languages. Uh, the other thing maybe will be also how you can extend the life cycle in a declarative way. Uh, right now we have two things for workflows. You have uh, like the declarative workflow, which somehow is kind of a bit fixed based on kind of uh, provided life cycle uh, in Tosca. And so every node in Tosca has this kind of um, life cycle that is shared and, and known by all the orchestrator. And based on the various nodes that you have in your topology and relationship, we are able to build uh, basically the workflow that, that is going to bring the topology to life. Uh, right now, if you want to do some very specific stuff that doesn't fit well in this declarative workflow out of the box, what you have to do in Tosca if you want to, to be portable is to write uh, imperative workflow. So define your own kind of logic, uh, even fully or just a partial piece of imperative workflow, but you have to do a piece of imperative. And what we would like is to bring some better ways to, um, to have a full declarative kind of workflow and allow people to include their own operation, their own state into that. And that's also a bit of the work that we do around, um, around the operation, the execution and artifact, seeing a bit how an operation can move a state from, uh, of a component from one state to another. And if we can really leverage that uh, to, uh, to solve fully the, the full workflow kind of things, or if we have to introduce uh, a bit of other things. And that's a complicated topic because um, running workflows is not just the state of the nodes, it's also how they are connected to each other and how you may have to weave some operations. So, so just, yeah, bring some operation in between uh, the nodes life cycle and not just have them waiting for each, for each other. So that may be a bit complex, but that's uh, what we hope to do, I think. I think that if, if we can do that, uh, both some better policies and better uh, declarative workflow handling with any kind of custom things, uh, will be, I think, on a very good point. Um, so maybe um, I wasn't asked, but maybe I can uh, add my opinion on this and give you guys some uh, some of my wish list for Tosca 1.2 and, and looking forward. How does that sound? I was going to ask you that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, terrific. Well, first, just a quick comment maybe about workflows. Um, you know, um, uh, in ARIA, we, we, we didn't wait for uh, workflows to be standardized by Tosca, and we, we provided a way to create workflows just because we have to. Um, you know, it's necessary right now. Um, and I'm, I'm watching the standardization process with some uh, skepticism, I guess. Uh, you know, as Luke pointed out, it's, it's very complicated um, to create in YAML a declarative language that can really fit lots and lots of complex workflow use cases. So for now, at least in ARIA, what we let you do is uh, let you drop it down to Python and use uh, you know, a very rich programming language to create your workflow graph of tasks and everything involved in it. So um, you know, there we don't really have some of these limitations because we can let users do whatever they want. Obviously, this is not part of the standard, but um, it's a good a good kind of test bed to see just how complex workflows can get. And, you know, you would eventually want the Tosca YAML grammar to, to match and power the Python grammar in this case as much as you can. Um, that probably will never be the case just because of the limitations of, of YAML, but, um, but you want to cover as many use cases as possible. So, so it's a good place to, to look at how workflows can happen. Um, but I, I really wanted to talk about some other things uh, not mentioned on my wish list for, for 1.2. Um, one of them is, you know, working on an ARIA, which is, you know, a really, um, um, it's, it's an orchestrator. It really does the work. And uh, we, we, we can't always deal with theory. We really have to deal with uh, real world use cases that we need to solve. And one problem we had was uh, that Tosca really, thinly defines uh, the, the uh, 
connection point between the uh, the YAML file and your scripts or whatever they are behind the scenes. So for, for every operation, you have an implementation string and possibly a list of dependencies that you can install as well. And, and that's it. <laughs> it's a very, very thin uh, uh, entry point. And I understand some of the reasoning behind defining that so loosely because you, you really don't want to um, enforce any specific uh, connection. So um, you want to keep it open for any implementation such as ARIA or Alien for Cloud to do uh, whatever they think is best in that case. But it makes it very, very hard to specify um, in, the, in your YAML file what you actually want to happen. I'll give you an example. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, you know, it, do you want to actually execute this artifact locally or remotely? Do you, if it's remotely, how are you actually executing it remotely? Do you need to log in via SSH? If you are logging in via SSH, what credentials are you going to use? Um, if you're not logging in via, via SSH, or for example, if you're running some sort of task using a centralized manager, if it's uh, Canonical's Juju, or if you're using Ansible, uh, a centralized Ansible, uh, uh, or you, know, you can have uh, uh, puppet agents. There, there are so many things that you want to do in orchestration, and having just a string with a few dependencies seems to be not enough. So once, one solution you can do is actually, of course, create your own interface type. So you can inherit the interface and create your own operations. There's, there's a very rich grammar for doing that. But some of the limitations of polymorphism means that if you do that, you also have to create your own node types that use those new interfaces. And uh, it gets very messy very, very quickly. So one suggestion that came out of our work is uh, to introduce perhaps a new type in Tosca, which I'm, I'll call an operation type. And that means that per operation, you can say, hey, this operation is a juju charm. This operation right. is... Well, you already have an artifact type, which is exactly uh, actually what it is. Artifact type is basically saying this operation, well, what it is. It's a shell script, it's a Python script, it's an Ansible stuff or, or whatever. So, so you can do that thanks to the artifact type, actually. And, so and basically, that, that's exactly what I was talking about when we were talking about uh, how we want to extend artifact type and let people uh, also provide more information. I think that, um, as you mentioned, where the artifact is executed, if there is a specific constraint for artifact execution, uh, is also one of the things we want to focus on. Um, eventually, even be able to deploy the system that allows you to run the artifact or, or providing a way to connect it to, to, to a remote endpoint. Uh, having kind of maybe using requirements of capabilities uh, for the artifacts, probably requirements in this case. Uh, that, that's part of the question that we want to try to solve here. So uh, that's, that's very interesting. So you would see a match between that implementation string that would be exactly an artifact. Um, I feel like uh, an artifact might not be the best place to define this because sometimes, you know, these operations are remote on some sort of uh, management server. Um, it's not necessarily an artifact seems to be in Tosca a file. So maybe this is a new kind of entity. But in any case, I'm very happy to hear that uh, you're thinking about the problem. <laughs> I would say that the artifact is a file and it has a type. And basically the artifact type, which is not the file, the file, the file is just the artifact and the file has a, has a type basically. So if you have a YAML, um, you can say that the YAML can be many things and you can specify that this YAML is actually, I would say my Ansible uh, artifact type somehow. And then my Ansible can run in a very specific way, uh, which may be even different from the way that some other people run Ansible. That's kind of the idea about uh, artifact types. And, and I think it will bring uh, a lot of clarity here, uh, but there is still a few things to be crafted there. Uh, but, but that really aims to solve these kind of issues. Um, then I think that there is another thing that can influence where artifacts are executed. So there is both this uh, do you have an artifact type or not and, and specific to the artifact type you may have a constraint on where it is executed and then you have um, beyond the artifact what is the target of the execution somehow like if you have a node that doesn't have any host probably you want to execute this uh, on an orchestrator sandbox whatever it is uh, for example when you want to create a vm on amazon uh, where you run it doesn't really matter. You just need to access the um, 
it's the API of Amazon. So you just need somehow the ability to connect your artifact type one to an uh, Amazon API endpoint uh, in a way. So in that case, the orchestrator is free to execute it on a manager node, uh, on a VM specific to an application, not specific to an application. That's really, uh, I would say that there's a part of where Tosca is free and we let the orchestrator choose what, what may be best or not for, for their users. Um, what is clear is that we don't constrain where it should be executed. We just say, you know, just find wherever you want to execute it and execute it because I don't have a host. When you run the software component on a host, then the targets at some point should be that host. Wherever you execute the artifact on the host, basically because, for example, it's a shell script, or if you execute it on uh, an Ansible management machine and just provide that the target host is actually the host that you want the artifact to be executed on by Ansible. So as a Tosca orchestrator, you won't execute the artifact on the host, but you will say that the target host is the one that your component is hosted on. So the declarative model uh, provides you a lot of information there. And right now what is missing is all the information from the artifact type. And that's what we're going to try to solve this year. So oh, look, it, it looks like you are saying that some or all of these issues that uh, Paul pointed out to uh, will be addressed by the work on artifacts in 1.2? Uh, yeah, I, I said I hope it will be fully in 1.2. It may not be fully in 1.2, <laughs> but that, that's the intent of the work we're doing at least. And, uh, and your second question was also uh, what we expect as, I think, um, as engagement for people also to help us and join. So maybe Tal can, uh, you know, join the discussions and help us there. Yeah, we, we are trying to clone him here, but so far unsuccessfully. Um, I, I have three of me here right now. Um, yeah, yeah. We, I was trying to make a false copy. <laughs> uh, but no, of course, I would be very happy uh, to join in that discussion. And, uh, and I wonder, I'm still a little skeptical if artifacts are the right place to do that. Um, but, you know, um, one of the great things about Tosca, it's really... Um, uh, it's an industry effort and there is room for inputs. I, I found that just joining the mailing list and, and voicing an opinion can actually have an effect. Uh, so I encourage everybody to do that. Um, I have one more item on my wish list. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, I don't know if you'd, you'd really want to hear it, but um, <laughs> the, it's a big one. You know, um, I feel that with Tosca 1.0, the simple profile was, was a, de a decent uh, first shot at really providing these common, lowest common denominator uh, uh, types for, um, for people to extend and, and create their own versions. But um, in trying to, to build real world examples based on them, um, uh, I think I feel that there, there, there's a lot of room for refactoring and improvement in these basic types. Um, Part of it is the issue that the, the Tosca grammar is actually very complex. Um, it's from an object-oriented perspective, there, there are a few things coming together. You have a no type, but it can also include capabilities that have their own type. It has interfaces that have their own type. Um, it could, um, um, and, and each of these allows you basically a way to kind of break the object-oriented model. So you can create you can inherit a node type and then use different kinds of capability types as long as they inherit from, uh, from the base types uh, in the parent type. It, it gets to be very complex. And what you see right now in the simple profile is that it's not always clear uh, what goes where. You have properties that are sometimes inside the node type itself and sometimes part of capabilities. Um, for example, the compute uh, node type, which is so important, you know, it's supposed to be the base type for uh, for virtual machines, for uh, containers, uh, for uh, bare metal machines. Um, it has a lot of aspects that are actually defined in, in its capabilities, but some of them are actually defined in the properties. So you have things like IP addresses uh, defined in the main node type, but then you have issues such as scalability and uh, CPU and operating system ability defined as capabilities. Um, we found it really uh, strange sometimes uh, to understand why some aspects are in capabilities and not in others. Uh, 
The big advantage of capabilities is that they can be reused in new types that do not inherit. For example, you can create a new node type that does not inherit from compute type, but uses a lot of the same capabilities that it does. Um, so there might be an advantage here of, of moving more and more things into capabilities because those are reusable blocks that can break the, the normal object-oriented model. Um, but as it stands right now, it, it, it's sometimes quite awkward uh, uh, to work with both of them. And I, and I think that's some of the challenges too that we've seen in moving towards the, uh, the NFV profile that we mentioned. Um, the struggle there is, you know, what do you do with these uh, basic simple types, such as compute, where you want to inherit, but you can't always inherit and do with it what you want due to, you don't want to break the basic contract uh, that you have with the base type. So you end up trying to deprecate features and, and things that uh, you really cannot do <laughs> in, in an object-oriented language. Um, so I, I, I would really hope that, you know, we can open up uh, all these basic types towards, uh, I would say, a major refactoring. And I don't know if that's on the roadmap right now. Maybe that's something that looks into maybe a Tosca 2.0, because that means a very massive change to the simple profile. But, um, but this, this is a challenge for us right now. How do we actually deal with these uh, sometimes awkward basic types? Yeah, let, let me just add a little bit, and I, I'm sure Luke will want to respond. But you, you are picking on, on one of the issues that I uh, sort of generally mentioned at the beginning, which creates this, this conflict um, that we have now with the NFV profile. Uh, I mean, we came to the, you know, we tried hard to use the, you know, to derive from, from Tosca normative types. Uh, and eventually with some we succeeded, but by deprecating uh, a lot of uh, attributes. On the other, and in some we did not succeed and we had to derive from, from directly from root. In, the, in talking with some of, uh, some of the other principles in Simply Yammer, for example, Matt, Matt Ratkowski was involved in that discussion. Uh, look, I believe you were not in those, those meetings, but the, the overall conclusion was that we may need to go back to Simply Yammer and introduce a set of abstract nodes, node types on top of the existing one and start deriving from those where those node types have less properties, so less things to, to deprecate and so on. I'm not sure, look, if you are aware of those discussion and, and, and what's your opinion on that and uh, when or how do you see this happening in, uh, in Simple YAML? I, I tend to agree with uh, we style that probably in the it's it's a two dot two dot x uh, you know issue rather than one dot x issue because it would be difficult otherwise it's probably going to break backward compatibility. Yeah, I don't have a, a, a full answer on that. I think that uh, what we are requesting a lot in the uh, simple YAML is to get uh, so some you know some inputs there, you know, on, on why uh, some types are not good enough, on how they should be. And, you know, I mean, modeling things is never very easy, especially when you're trying to have the right level of abstractions. Um, regarding what Tal says on properties and properties within capabilities, I think that uh, it, it's mainly, in my opinion, a kind of, um, a kind of of knowing if things are um, like configuration, like I would say that if a configuration is very specific to the node, it, it would probably be more kind of node properties. If some things are more used for being able to match things and you know uh, find a valid target before deployment time or, or kind of things like that, um, capabilities are very good for that because it helps to have a, a, lot, uh, a lot less tight coupling of things. Um, but but anyway, it's never really easy to find the right uh, level, I would say, in uh, in this kind of modeling. So so there is room for improvement. Um, regarding timeline, I don't have any ideas because right now we don't have enough inputs, even from the NFV world. You know, we we heard a lot that you know things have to be changed, but we don't have a lot of inputs like you know on this type. Uh, this thing has to be changed. This is what we propose, and this is why we propose it. And this is really what we like currently in the uh, in the Tosca simple profile to have uh, some people doing exactly this work 
beforehand and you know coming back to us with okay this type uh, we don't like it for this reason uh, and this is how it should be or, or maybe this is uh, or maybe we need just a type in between roots and this type just to have another kind of more abstracted type that uh, that would be uh, used in to for, for both nav and uh, and other use case if it makes sense to have two different nodes so so I would say that I fully agree that there is room for for improvement. Um, I think that some nodes, like even database and so on, are maybe not uh, good enough. Also, uh, some other things I think are very good, and I think that, for example, the endpoint um, capability is quite good and, and allow a lot of things to to be um, to be inferred from this uh, actual capability. It's it's a very uh, loose couple of things that. In, in the application world as everything that you need to make a connection and you can do a lot of things based on that and, and orchestrator can infer a lot of things based on that. So, so there's also some very interesting stuff, but yes, there's also a lot of room for, for improvement and we need uh, definitely some, uh, some use case for that. And if you have some, and if you can, uh, you know, just send, uh, send us a very clear thing on, you know, why, why this is not good, what would be the proposal and why you want to defend it and eventually you know uh, just send an email on the mailing list eventually say that you want that to be uh, put on the table in one of the yaml call and then you know we can schedule a specific yaml call and invite uh, you if you don't have the time to be at every yaml call or that, that i can understand because it's kind of time consuming uh, it can be good also that if you have a topic and you want to defend it just to be at one specific call and we can put that on the agenda so yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and I, I want to just agree with you. I think the, the endpoint capabilities are, are a really great feature in uh, the simple profile, and I think well thought out. Uh, the problem is that they're not used universally. There are, there are places where a simple string property is used instead of this endpoint. So, so that's the kind of inconsistency that I see in the simple profile that makes it uh, sometimes challenging to define things. There, there are sometimes even multiple ways to do the same thing. You can put a property and you can put an endpoint and then you have to ask yourself what to do. Uh, I hope that the, the good rule of thumb, I think, is to use always err on the side of using a capability instead of putting it in the base uh, uh, node type because almost always the capability gives you more flexibility and uh, more reusability. Um, and, and, you know, maybe you know, I, I didn't mention this. I, I focused on the compute node, but but I think the big challenge, of course, in Tosca is networking. Um, the simple profile defines a few endpoints, as as you said, uh, for networking that are that aren't bad. But uh, but but we've really seen moving towards NFE. Uh, if you come from the world of enterprise and you think you know networking. <laughs> Uh, you're wrong. <laughs> the NFC is, is, is an order of magnitude more complex in terms of, of what networking even means. Uh, so, so we're really seeing uh, people trying to use the simple profile for networking and immediately saying, uh, this is insufficient. We, we have uh, far more compli complex uh, uh, needs here. You, you know, we have virtual networking, we have software defined networking, and it, uh, an address can't just be a string, which is an IPv4, or even IPv6 string. Um, so, so we really, I think, you know, moving towards, if I can call that uh, right now, a simple profile 2.0 would be uh, in my dream, in my fantasy, uh, I ideal utopia. It would be uh, <clears throat> a collection of basic types that would be able to satisfy the NFE industry and, and, you know, I think if they satisfy the NFE industry, then for sure they would also satisfy a small subset of it would satisfy the enterprises as well. Um, I think we can do that. I think, um, I think, you know, it's a kind of chicken and egg problem. Uh, you know, the more the industry actually embraces it, the more the industry would be able to fix it. Uh, we're at a point right now where, where um, our challenge is just to build things, build things on what's there. Sometimes it'll be awkward, um, but if we actually make them work, you know, we have products right now. If, if we had this conversation a year ago, the, the situation would be very different. But as of right now, in uh, July 2017, we, we have implementations of Tosca. We have things that actually work and orchestrate and, and do things in the real world. So, 
So we can't uh, wait anymore for uh, theoretical discussions. Uh, we're at the point where we're actually going to start getting feedback from, uh, from working and implementation. So I'm optimistic. Well, Tal, you're, you're pointing out several things, right? I mean, one of the things you pointed out is that there are multiple ways of um, modeling and multiple ways in Tosca that allow modeling in multiple ways. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. Uh, but I look at Tosca as a set of tools and how you use the tools is, is up to us to describe a best practice for a particular domain maybe. Uh, that would be maybe a, you know, a, a solution to that problem. The other thing that you have mentioned, which I fully agree, is that there are implementations but I think that, uh, and we have to deal with that, but I think that a year ago or, or two years ago when there were not sufficient implementation, things were, um, the standard was developed more or less in a vacuum, right? And it, it, there's nothing good or bad about it. That's the way things are. Now that the implementation exists and, and uh, best practices will come out probably out of those implementations, that gives us an opportunity to to experiment uh, in the real world with the Tosca tools that exist and maybe do come back in, you know, in a 2.0 to create a better, longer lasting version. Absolutely. <laughs> so do you guys have any other topics? We got another five, maybe even 10 minutes. If you guys have anything, uh, interesting you still want to talk about. Well, I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask uh, uh, the following question from, from both uh, the other um, participants. And that is, um, how, how, how is best to, um, to create feedback and and is, is the Simple YAML team sympathetic to feedback? So feedback coming from hands-on work in different communities. Uh, do you see this happening already? To what extent would you like to see feedback from what's happening in, uh, in the ARIA community? To what extent do you wanna like to see feedback from ONAP community? Is there equivalent communities that provide um, feedback uh, in the enterprise world? Well, I would say that feedbacks mostly come from the uh, various people in the TC that actually um, are trying to build tools or have already customers in production with some of the tools, which, uh, which is our case with the InfoCloud, which is your case with uh, Aya and, uh, and Cloudify. And I guess that uh, the more people, uh, you know, really tries to, to share things in the TC or to try to, to, to bring them, um, the, the more it will get useful. Nokia also shared a lot of uh, things that they have, uh, even some concerns on, uh, on things that, even questions I would say that, you know, should these things be into the, the specification or should it remain uh, specific to tools? Uh, it also helped us to, uh, to also just clarify things that was, uh, you know, kind of, clear for us, but not, not clear in the spec, <laughs> I think. So, so feedback is always good. We probably don't have enough of it. And I think that uh, we can get more of it uh, for, for various people. And what I think we would love to is also to get, uh, as I said, all this kind of structured kind of feedback um, with, with a very kind of well explained, you know, use case, well, what really is the use case and why, uh, why some limitations, um, you know, uh, in Tosca or, or in types or, or grammar or things that could be extended, uh, you know, are, are causing any issues uh, or, or even things that are good. It's also it's nice to hear uh, good feedbacks too. But uh, but yes, having real use cases and just explaining, okay, I have this use case and that's such a trouble for me. And, and that gives uh, a good start for people to try to think. And maybe uh, if you have already think about a solution, just try to present it. If you don't have a solution, just you know bring the the use case in the most detailed way as you can, so people really understand it. Because uh, I think that's kind of the uh, complexity here, and and that's also the complexity of NFV. And 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 I think that's the hard thing about 
uh, an FVP poll talking to uh, to more uh, application kind of people uh, in the simple uh, profile, which is that uh, NAV didn't always bring a very detailed use case, you know, and just said, okay, I, I have this kind of need, I need that. And, and without the use case, we cannot really understand things uh, clearly. And I think that that is things that are changing and we have, um, I mean, we receive more and more feedbacks and more and more detailed feedbacks, I think, so that will probably help to, uh, to improve these types and to improve uh, various things. So, I, I tend to agree with you in the in the sense of NAV use cases, right? I mean, um, typically, the problem that I see was that um, NAV reflection in in the Tosca community has been by saying this is the VNF model and you, you know, you have to create the extensions to comply with that rather than bringing NAV use cases and trying to see how best simple uh, YAML can address them, right? It has been mostly, you should match this model. Then, you know, don't worry about the use cases. We already dealt with that and we created this information model. I think this is part of the problem. But, but having said that, I'd also like I'd also like to understand what you personally think from the perspective of interest and willingness uh, of the Simple YAML main participants to really create uh, a Simple YAML version that is uh, gener more, gen more generic and uh, more apt to address multiple markets. Or do you rather think that things will continue the way they are, where the simple YAML, as it is right now, mainly uh, is focused on the enterprise um, market, and there will always be some, some sort of a split with an NAV profile that does things differently because of the networking issues that Tal mentioned. Well, I think that Fundamentally, uh, it would be good to, to try to uh, break the split and to lower it. Uh, the right question would be, uh, can we achieve that uh, by keeping enough simplicity for, for usability, for enterprise use case usability, uh, with enough details also for NAV use case? Uh, can we have common types? Can we have extensions? And yes, if we can do that, uh, I, I mean, I think we all agree that, that we want to reach this point. The question is that in very short term, I think it's, uh, it's kind of an utopia probably, uh, just because, because we have to get more understanding on the NFV use cases uh, in order to really understand what is missing and in order to see, um, and we need concrete proposal, you know, on what, what the type could be also. Uh, so, so that's that's kind of the intent, and probably it would be a V2. That's why I don't expect that to to come in a in a very short term, to be honest. Uh, but uh, but I think it would probably uh, be a good thing. If really it doesn't work out, I don't think also that this is a, a blocking issue. I would say uh, what is critical for me, I think, is that the orchestration principle in Tosca, uh, the grandma, and so on, are, are, are are working well, you know, and even if you don't use the same type, somehow you can use the same orchestrator if you follow the, the same kind of orchestration principle, declarative modeling, way to generate workflows and so on. So if we can really, you know, uh, work on that and have that, we still have portability and we still have orchestrators that can uh, orchestrate both worlds, which is, I think, already a very good value. And then, then I'm not sure about the model, you know, I, th I think it would be better to, if we can merge it correctly. But if we don't, I don't think that it's uh, absolutely blocker. That's kind of my position, I guess. I think we have an opportunity in the short term to, to sort of uh, have an overlay kind of approach uh, for both enterprise and, uh, and NIV and the opportunities in starting working on the network service uh, use cases, right? So, so we started with uh, in the NAB profile on the VNF, and the VNF um, is really following the, the VNF information model in Etsy NAB, which created some some of those uh, conflicts and uh, and splits, right? But the but the network service, I think we should we should start from the beginning working 
jointly between the NAV uh, profile, NAV ad hoc team and the simple YAML to avoid the same problems. Because the network service, as it is defined in, uh, in NAV, is a relatively broad concept, which uh, will require in the, in the service template descriptions of uh, references to VNF, but also references to, to IT world entities, databases and other things, right? So that is, I think, the opportunity where we cannot miss. And, and we should, there we should be able to, um, to approach the network service definition in HCNAV and their use cases in such a way that they, f that they can fully be represented and modeled with, with simply YAML. And if not, uh, simply YAML should then be extended to, to address those things. Because if we miss that opportunity, then uh, the split becomes uh, broader. So I'll, I'll just comment very briefly about, about the process. You know, obviously I agree with uh, the challenges and, and the concerns and the hopes here. Uh, but I, I wonder if, you know, if, if Oasis, uh, the Tosca TC sits and waits for feedback on the mailing list, uh, not a lot is going to come in. Uh, one of our challenges is that everybody who's working in this industry is just very, very busy. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts right now. There's a lot of things we need to do. Um, the ARIA project is moving very quickly. Um, we, we just don't have too much time to return feedback. Um, you know, we're still working on implementing 1.0 and 1.1 is being finalized. We've been talking about 1.2 right now. Uh, we're, just, we're just busy scrambling uh, to get the work done. So perhaps part of the process could be that the Oasis uh, Tosca TC would have its own project to go out there and solicit feedback from uh, from companies, from organizations, from uh, people implementing Tosca, people using Tosca. Uh, it could be some way that uh, you know <laughs> would be the opposite direction of sitting and waiting, but rather uh, going out there and from your initiative uh, going and getting that data. Uh, but then I know that you're busy too, <laughs> so. Well, th there is still a sort of a formal uh, or, or semi-formal way already, right? On, on the on-app side, for example, you have, uh, you have liaisons to different organizations. In particular, in this case, to Oasis Tosca, we have, uh, I think, Fitao and, uh, and Alex own that in, in on-app. So that would be the, you know, whether, whether the request comes from Tosca to ONAP or vice versa, I think the channel exists to make this a sort of a formal request or formal feedback if we want. Sure, I, well, ONAP is, is the very, it's the largest user, possible user of Tosca, but I'm thinking also of a lot of smaller innovators that are out there. Uh, startups and other companies doing uh, possibly very interesting things with Tosca. You want to hear from them too and not just the, the big players in the room. But I really appreciate uh, all you guys coming on and sharing everything, um, you know, that all this knowledge, it's really interesting stuff going on with Tosca around NFV and everything else. So uh, hopefully we can have you guys on again uh, in the near future and uh, really appreciate you guys coming by to, uh, to do this with us. Uh, thank thanks, for, uh, yeah, thanks for inviting us, uh, Jeremy, and I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to see that uh, Luke and Paul were able to join. Yeah, it was great. Thanks, guys. I, I learned a lot from my colleagues, as usual. Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.